This is the day that Christ, the Lamb of God, gave himself into the hands of those who would slay him. This is the day that Christ gathered with his disciples in the upper room. This is the day that Christ took a towel and washed the disciples' feet, giving us an example that we should do to others as he has done to us. This is the day that Christ our God gave us this holy feast that we who eat this bread and drink this cup may here proclaim his holy sacrifice and be partakers of his resurrection and at the last day may reign with him in heaven. Together, let us pray. O oh God, your Son, Jesus Christ, has left to us this meal of bread and wine in which we share his body and his blood. May we who celebrate this sign of his great love show in our lives the fruits of his redemption through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. God said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two, two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. 
you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of God. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am God. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to God. Through your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church.
The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of Christ. of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. When I was a little boy, every so often my brother Jeff and I would have sleepovers at Grandma and Grandpa's. And we loved going because Grandma and Grandpa had a swimming pool and every night it seemed like we had french fries for supper and chocolate chip cookies for dessert. And every night, as we crawled under the covers in the spare bedroom, Grandma would come and kiss us on the cheek and say, Sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Now, bed bugs always scared the heck out of me. Like, seriously, if God needed an 11th plague to convince the Egyptians to let the Israelites go, I bet it was going to be bedbugs. 
And as I laid with those covers pulled up to my neck, staring back at me from across the room in the shadowy light were the figures from this very painting. For hours, I would be looking at them and they'd be looking back at me, each of us carefully studying the other. And I remember wondering why they all sat on one side of the table. And I remember wondering, why did they all look so upset? Except for the one sitting at the right hand of Jesus, he looked like he was drunk or asleep or both. And then the one sitting at the left hand of Jesus, he looked like he just saw a bed bug crawling across the table. So eventually that little boy grew up and sleepovers at grandma and grandpa's occurred less and less. And, but I never forgot that painting. Of course, how could you, right? It's a copy of one of the most well-known paintings in the world, Da Vinci's Last Supper. In fact, it's so well-known that we don't actually pay much attention to it. You see, we think we know this scene, but due to a psychological phenomena known as scotomization, our minds choose what they want to see and edit out the details that we don't want to see. A point made famously by Dan Brown in his book, The Da Vinci Code, where you see this feminine figure seated at the right hand of Jesus with long flowing hair just swooning away. However, what Dan Brown doesn't mention is that throughout Renaissance art, the beloved disciple John was always shown beside Jesus. And he was always depicted as a young, beardless, often androgynous character. In fact, Leonardo kept this kind of depiction because an androgynous young man was his ideal of beauty and one that constantly reoccurs throughout his art. Another point made famous by the Da Vinci Code is that there is no common cup on the table. And Dan Brown's right. There is no single chalice. Instead, everyone has their own little cup, much like the ones we use to serve juice during coffee hour. However, what he fails to mention is that the source text that da Vinci used for the Last Supper was not Matthew, Mark, or Luke's Gospel where Jesus institutes the Eucharist. Rather, he uses the passage from John's Gospel, which we just read tonight a passage that focuses exclusively on Jesus dropping the bombshell that one of his disciples is going to betray him, which is why everyone looks so startled. Now, I've included a guide as to who's who in this scene in your bulletin, and I'd like to take a closer look at Judas, who is the fourth figure from the left, because there's some really intriguing details about his portrayal. Now, the cover of the bulletin might be a clear um, replication of that painting, so you might want to look at that. So when the other Renaissance artists depicted the Last Supper, Judas was either the only disciple who did not have a halo, or else Judah was seated separately from all of the other apostles. Da Vinci, however, seats everyone on the same side of the table, no halos, and he includes Judas right in the midst of everybody. This is important. Yet even so, the signs of Judas' betrayal mark him. First of all, he's grasping a small bag, no doubt symbolizing the 30 pieces of silver he has been paid to betray Jesus. And second, he has also knocked over the salt shaker in front of him, another symbol of betrayal. His head is also positioned lower than everyone else, and in the painting, he is the only person left in shadow. Now, Judas' betrayal may be the most famous one in all of history, not only because of whom he betrays, but also because of who he is. You see, Judas was not an enemy outsider, but actually he's a member of the inner circle. He's one of the disciples who's been with Jesus right from the very start. Yet because we know how things turn out in the end, we have so many preconceptions as to who Judas really was. We tend to imagine him as some kind of fringe member of the group, a shifty-looking character always standing off to one side by himself. 
But da Vinci shows us this wasn't true. Judas would have been one of the most trusted of the twelve, the one whom the disciples put in charge of all the money. You see, it was Judas' job to keep food on the table, both for them and for the poor. He's like their treasurer and their stewardship chairman all rolled into one. And they love him. They trust him to manage their resources and to share them wisely because Judas is one of them. He's the Lord's friend. He has walked hundreds and hundreds of kilometers with them. He has sat around the campfire with them and slept out under the stars with them. In fact, if Judas had been the odd man out, the other disciples would have known right away who Jesus was talking about at dinner that night. But they didn't. Very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me, he said, and they all stopped chewing to look around at each other because they couldn't imagine who it would be. Now, being betrayed by a stranger is hard enough, but being betrayed by someone close to you, someone you deeply trust, someone you've shared your life with, well, that's like having your heart ripped out, right? So perhaps the wisdom hidden in this story, as pointed out by Barbara Brown Taylor, is that the church has far less to fear from outsiders than it does from insiders. You see, we're much more likely to encounter the enemy from within our midst than in the world outside our doors. And so to understand Judas is to understand the shadow side of the church, where every single one of us has it within ourselves to betray those that we love. Now, according to legend, Judas was the zealot amongst Jesus' disciples. He was the one who was ready to fight the Romans to the death and who longed for a warrior Messiah that would lead them into battle against the Romans. Judas was the one who had in mind a crown of gold and jewels for Jesus, not a crown of thorns. So when it became clear that Jesus was not going to meet his expectations of a triumphant warrior Messiah, it was Judas who believed that he had been betrayed. And if that is what led him to do what he did, then God knows he's not the first person or the last person who turned murderous when someone he loved failed to make his dreams come true. However, it's not possible to understand Judas without understanding Jesus as well. Because Judas doesn't act in a vacuum. Right? Jesus also makes choices. And in our gospel, do you remember how Jesus identifies his betrayer? Right? Jesus identifies his betrayer by feeding him. Not by casting him out, not by, by tying him up or beating him up or launching a preemptive strike so that he won't be able to carry out his plan. Jesus identifies his betrayer by feeding him, by dipping a piece of bread into his own cup and giving it to Judas, whose feet he had just washed and dried with a towel that he wore around his waist. Knowing who Judas is and what Judas is about to do, it's important for us to see here that Jesus does not throw him out. Jesus washes him and feeds him, which means that Judas is never, never excluded from the circle of friends. Judas is included until he excludes himself. But before he does, Jesus gives them this new commandment, that they love one another as he loves them. That's how people will know who they are because they love one another like that. Everything else Jesus has taught them is important, but this one thing, this one thing is so crucial. Their love for one another will be the one true mark of their discipleship. Not their knowledge, not their piety, certainly not their good works, but by their love, by their love will they be known. So when Jesus dips that piece of bread into his cup and handed it to Judas, he not only revealed who Judas was, he also revealed who he was, right? The one who feeds his enemies, the one who goes on treating them as his friends, the one who is loyal to them, loyal to the very end. Because when Jesus holds up that cup and says, drink this, all of you, 
This is the blood of my new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Well, he's talking to some pretty sketchy people, right, who have more than just a short list of sins. Jesus is talking to people who are going to turn him in, people who are going to scatter at the first sign of trouble and will swear that they never knew him. He's talking to people who should have been his best friends on earth, but who will turn out not to have a loyal bone in their body. And he is forgiving them all. He's forgiving them all ahead of time. Likewise for us, right? Because we come before our Lord who knows absolutely everything about us. I mean, he doesn't know as much as Facebook, but it's, it's pretty close. Because the Lord knows every thought and every desire that we've ever had. And he knows when we have betrayed him and when we have betrayed others. Now that knowledge alone is pretty scary and disturbing. So it might be helpful for us to remember that no matter who you are or what you've done or what you will do, our Lord's faithfulness to us does not depend on our faithfulness to him and that his love for us will never end. Because he's going to keep offering to feed us again and again and again and again. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sitting, kneeling, or standing, we offer prayers to our gracious God. We gather as the household of God, apostles, prophets, martyrs, servants, to pray for the church and all humankind, saying, Come, Lord Jesus. For refugees and for the homeless and for all who have nowhere to lay their head, we pray. For those unable to eat at the Lord's table or any other table, we pray. For the body of Christ, fractured in a world of violence and war, we pray. For those who betray and for those whom they betray, we pray. for our own needs and those of others. To you we pray. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We thank you, praying. We pray for all those who have died in the peace of Christ and for those whose faith is known to you alone that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Trusting in you, we pray. Gracious God, you have heard the prayers of your faithful people. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Grant our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites us to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all of your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
I would invite you to stand as you're able. My sisters and brothers, the peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to share that peace.
and together we say the prayer over the gifts. Merciful God, we spread this table to remember the loving sacrifice of Jesus Christ, your Son. Accept all we offer you this day. Bind us together in his love and in the love he has commanded us to bring one another through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. We give you thanks and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, who for our salvation became obedient unto death. The tree of defeat became the tree of victory, where life was lost, life has been restored. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the heavenly chorus, we cry out to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, in calling Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of air into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On this very night, he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted. Our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice that we made acceptable in him may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new, and bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread, communion in Christ's body once broken. Let your church be the wheat which bears its fruit in dying. If we have died with him, we shall live with him. If we hold firm, we shall reign with him. My sisters and brothers, these are the gifts of God for us, the children of God. Thanks be to God.
Together, let us pray. Holy God, source of all love, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave his disciples a new commandment, to love one another as he loved them. Write this commandment in our hearts. Give us the will to serve others as he was the servant of all, who gave his life and died for us, yet is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.